Lord, we love you and we thank you so much that you are our great redeemer. God, thank you for, again, as it's already been expressed, bringing us through another week. Thank you for the fellowship of the saints, our corporate prayer, being able to collectively lift up our voices in praise and adoration because you alone are worthy of that. You're the reason we're here today. And it's already been requested that you would speak into each of us, that we would receive something from your word. And so in that confidence, knowing that by your spirit you want us to to grasp your truth, I pray for your enablement today. For my brothers in Christ that are speaking in pulpits across this nation and around the globe, I pray, Lord, that you would enable them and anoint them by your spirit to proclaim your truth boldly and with passion. And God, that you would receive the credit for what you're going to do in our lives, what you're going to work in and what you're going to work out as a result of of being in your house today. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your love. Thank you for who you are. We praise you in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Are you familiar with this statement? Nothing worth having was ever achieved without effort. Parenting, healthy marriages, job skills, genuine friendship, or as I read this week, authentic community. The kind of born out of hard work, sacrifice, and service to others. So much of what passes today for community, and I put quotes around that, is ideological groupthink. It's superficial adherence to ever-fluctuating levels of what's deemed acceptable or unacceptable. For instance, within the woke movement, if you're not socially aware, if you're not with it, according to their definition, you're out and susceptible to public outrage or even cancellation. Thankfully, the living God has a better blueprint for authentic relational community regardless of skin color regardless of economic or political status regardless of culture or gender equally reflecting as we do the image of our creator God's made it possible through the sacrifice of his son and the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit to experience deep and satisfying communion, not just with Him, but with each other. Can you believe it? We can actually get along very well because of who God is. Here's how Paul expressed it to the church of Ephesus. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be what? Patient, that's one we've all got figured out, right? Bearing with one another, how? In love. Make every effort to keep or preserve the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. True community cannot be superficial, notes Vince Vitale. It takes patience. It takes bearing with one another. It takes effort. We can find the unity we long for. Not by bypassing disagreement, but by finding a love big enough to disagree well and by finding a truth big enough to unite us. Where might a person discover that kind of love and truth? Right here, within the pages of this bestseller. Today, I want to lay the groundwork for a new book series kind of on genuine community. What it means to really work this thing out in our lives called Christianity. But before I do, turn with me to one of Paul's prison epistles. He wrote four of them. This was written while he was under house arrest in Rome. Turn to the book of Colossians in chapter 1. Colossians in chapter 1. 
Some think that maybe it happened in Ephesus, but most scholars agree it was during the time that Paul was under that two years of house arrest in Rome. But Colossians chapter 1, let's pick it up at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, an approved or spokesperson, one that was uh, sent as kind of the personal rep of the Lord Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Timothy, of course, joined Paul during his second missionary journey. To the saints, the holy are consecrated and faithful brethren in Christ. And Jesus, of course, is the one that sets us apart. Who are where? In Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, or Epaphras, take your pick, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. He told us, he made plain to us, about your relationship with Christ through the Spirit. Epaphras, or Epaphras, was a ministry companion of Paul, a dear fellow servant, and a faithful minister on behalf of the Colossians. He was instrumental in their evangelization and spiritual growth, along with other area churches close by. He also visited Paul during his Roman imprisonment, where he recounted how these local fellowships were faring. So Colossians is Paul's reply based on his partner's report. Look at verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you, A, may be filled with the knowledge of, of His will, that you may be immersed in it, that you may be saturated or marinated by it. Picture a ship laden down or crammed with supplies about to head out. And this is the picture that Paul has in mind. This is what we're praying for you, to be filled in this way with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom or practical know-how and spiritual understanding or application. We want this knowledge to be visceral and experiential. Why? Be that you may have something. That you may have what? A life, a walk worthy of the Lord. Fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might or spiritual vitality according to His glorious power, His dunamis for all patience, there's that word again, and long-suffering with joy. Things that are so instrumental in healthy relationships. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. To share in this inheritance of the saints in the light. True or false, when God controls you on the inside, you'll be genuine on the outside. True. Sadly, some believers want the knowledge of God's will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding, but not the life that knowledge requires. Just as other folk long for deeper community, but they fail to do the work that meaningful relationships demand. Good relationships don't just happen. They require what? Effort. Work. In Paul's mind, and I quote, the Christian life is more than simply giving up bad habits. It is acquiring a newness of mind which comes from setting your heart and mind on Christ Jesus who is the image 
of the invisible God. Nothing worth having, spiritual or otherwise, was ever achieved without effort. And so Paul drafts a letter. A letter in which he publicly addresses the issues facing the Colossian church. But he also pens a personal note to a brother residing in Colossae named Philemon. Philemon. His desire, Paul's desire, was for both dispatches to be delivered simultaneously. Go over to chapter 4 of Colossians and look at verse 7. Chapter 4 and verse 7. Tychicus, who is a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort or encourage your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. So Tychicus and Onesimus are Paul's emissaries, carrying two letters from the imprisoned apostle to Colossae. The former was a beloved brother, a faithful or responsible minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. But what of the latter? Of him, Paul simply states, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, meaning he was from Colossae. Now, the Greek word for faithful in verse 9 of chapter 4 refers to one characterized by steadfast affection or allegiance. In the case of Onesimus, it meant he was devoted to Paul. He was aligned with Paul. Unlike Tychicus, he was not a faithful minister or fellow servant in the Lord who, upon his return, would inquire of the Colossian church and comfort their hearts. That was Tychicus, not Onesimus. So we ask ourselves, who was Onesimus? What was he doing in Rome? And why was Paul sending such a committed believer personally back to Colossae? Here's the abbreviated answer. Onesimus was a slave. One among millions dwelling in the Roman Empire. Slavery was, in the words of one Bible commentator, an accepted institution, a daily part of life. Backstory. Apparently Onesimus had stolen from his master Philemon and sailed to Rome where he might blend in with the dregs of society. Thieves love fellow thieves. So he was a thief. He's a fugitive who, while hiding in Rome, happened to cross paths with Paul. How, we are not told. But rest assured, their introduction was born of divine providence. God had his hand in it. The summation of Dr. J.B. Lightfoot is appropriate. At Rome, the apostles spread his net. He cast his net for him. What kind of net was Paul throwing out there? A gospel net. The good news of Jesus Christ. And Onesimus was caught in its meshes. This led to Onesimus' salvation or becoming a new creation in Christ, which impacted his current situation. What do I mean? Jesus invaded his life via the Holy Spirit. His heart began to be transformed through Paul's teaching. He was gloriously forgiven. He began to serve his spiritual mentor. But by Roman law, he belonged to another. He had a master back in Colossae. Philemon, a man he robbed and who could legally put him to death for his crimes. He had that right. Slaves were so much chattel. Do with them as you please. Would Onesimus return and right the wrong, or would he remain with Paul? What would you do? What would I do in that situation? Nothing worth having was ever achieved without effort. Clearly, Apostle's counsel for Onesimus would be to return and fulfill his Christian duty. And we base that on comments that Paul made 
about slavery found elsewhere. Let's begin with 1 Corinthians in chapter 7. Bear with me, we're doing the backstory here. 1 Corinthians in chapter 7. A passage actually addressing marriage. Where, and I quote, the principle of remaining in one's marital relationship, which Paul is discussing, is part of a more general principle. And here's the general principle. In everything, the Christian is to remain in his or her calling unless it is immoral. You don't stay in that. Okay, look at verse 17 of chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians. But as God has distributed to each one, or assigned, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Was anyone called while circumcised? And this is to salvation. Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God... That's what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. Don't let it trouble you. But if you can, be made free. Rather, use it. If you can gain your freedom legally, then do so. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that calling in which he was called. You see, the Lord's calling is higher than any earthly position or standing. And as such, it's a game changer. That has great bearing in how we live out this life here and now. Travel back to Colossians and look at verse chapter 3 of Colossians. Colossians in chapter 3. Your fingers are going to get a workout this morning. I'm just telling you right now. Chapter 3 and verse 22. Colossians. The Apostle Paul. Servants. Again, this would be Christian servants. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service. As men pleasers. But in sincerity of heart, fearing God. That means whether he's watching or not, you're doing what he wants you to do. And whatever you do, do it how? Heartily, energetically, diligently, as from the soul. Give it your best effort as to the Lord and not to men. Why? Knowing that from the Lord who's watching, you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For truly you serve who? The Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for the wrong which he has done. And there is no partiality. For example, chapter 4, verse 1, masters, slave owners in the Colossian church, Christian ones, give your servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a what? A master where? In heaven. Now go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And look at verse 5. I said go over. I should have said... Go back to Ephesians in chapter 6. In verse 5. Servants, here we go again. Be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in sincerity of heart, as to who? Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. Whether he is a slave or free. And you masters do the same things to them. Giving up threatening. Knowing that your own master also is in heaven. And there is no partiality with him. Nowhere in scripture will you find Paul criticizing the institution of slavery. You just won't find it. But you will hear him challenging Christian slaves and masters to flesh out their faith within that evil system. That's repeatedly said throughout. I just showed you the passages. Wiersbe notes, the gospel itself preached 
and lived in the early church, that early community ultimately destroyed this social problem. Paul's letter to Philemon is a classic example of how Christ changes a home and society by changing lives. It was not that Paul avoided the problem of slavery. Rather, he realized the true solution would be found as men and women gave their hearts to Christ. And that's still the solution to this very day. Doesn't history validate what I'm saying? You're going to love this if you're a history buff. John Newton, the notorious British slave trader, was converted during a violent storm at sea in 1748. Twenty-four years later, in 1772, after becoming an Anglican clergyman and abolitionist, he penned his now famous hymn. What is it? Amazing Grace. And that captures a supernatural reason for his new course in life. William Wilberforce, British politician, contemporary of Newton, was converted in 1785, five years after joining Parliament. As a devoted follower of Christ, he was instrumental in heading the arduous and lengthy campaign that led to the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, which eliminated slavery in most of the British Empire. He died just three days after hearing the passage of the act was assured. God gave him that nugget before he graduated. Harriet Beecher Stowe, native of Litchfield, Connecticut. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I read it. Christian abolitionist and author of a book. Anybody remember the book she wrote? Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852. It informed northerners about the abuses of slavery and infuriated southerners who owned the slaves. Its influence in America and beyond cannot be overstated. In 1862, ten years after publication and during the early days of the Civil War, Mrs. Beecher actually got to meet President Lincoln at the White House. Now, the story of their dialogue is somewhat vague, okay? It's debated about what was or wasn't said. Apparently, they got a lot of giggles out of the visit. They, they talk about it. It's an interesting read. But anyway, her son reported that Lincoln greeted her by saying, so you are the little woman who wrote the book that started this great war. That was their introduction. Question, what was the spiritual denominator that connected these individuals. What's the one thing they all shared in common? The grace gift of Jesus Christ. Each was born again. Each was spiritually changed within and that affected societal change without. But it started where? In the heart of the individual. Did it cost them personally? Was it easy to be a dedicated follower of Jesus in those turbulent times? Do you think their public service driven by personal surrender was worth it? What would they say if they could speak to us today? I think they would gladly shout, Yes! Why? Because we all long to become recipients of heaven's affirming welcome his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Nothing worth having, spiritual or otherwise, was ever achieved without effort. Would Onesimus return and right the wrong committed against Philemon? Or would he remain with Paul? Would he trust the Lord with his life and step out with letter in hand? Or would he allow the fear of death to keep him stuck in Rome, slithering around with the dregs of society? Turn, if you would, to the shortest New Testament letter penned by the Apostle Paul, consisting of only 335 Greek words. The book of Philemon. Philemon. I would say chapter 1. <laughs> That's it. It's just chapter 1. Philemon and verse 1. 
Some say there's 334 Greek letters. 335, not a big deal. Verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. And Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, or Philemon, depending on how you want to say it. Think Philemon, Philemon, all right? Our beloved friend and fellow laborer. To the beloved Aphia, Archippus, or Archippos. That's how I heard one guy pronounce it, Archippos. Take your pick. Our fellow soldier. And to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The conclusion of Paul's greeting in verse 3 mirrors most of his letters. Grace to you, he says, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Note the order which never changes. Grace, God's free provision through Christ for our every need, always precedes peace or a spiritual state born from a proper relationship between God and man. Paul elaborates on this in Romans. Since we have been justified or made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. Being at peace with God always follows on the heels of divine grace, which opens the door to experiential peace or the peace of God as we yield our lives to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. However, as much as Paul's words mimic his other salutations, this personal communique is wholly different from the rest. And for these reasons, first, it's addressed to a single individual. A layman by the name of... How do you want to say it? Philemon? No one wants to go with Philemon? Okay, Philemon, we'll stick with that. Others are mentioned... But he is the primary focus. And this is made evident by Paul's use of second person singular pronouns, such as in verse 2, where he refers to the church in your singular house. In this other letters, he targets a wider audience, even when addressed to specific persons, like in the pastoral epistles. He writes to Timothy and to Titus, but it has bearing on the entire church. Everybody. Secondly, though Paul's petition on behalf of Onesimus was of private importance, being a domestic matter pertinent to Philemon's household, it would undoubtedly affect the church at large meeting in his house. Based on what? His family's response. What are they going to do about this exhortation to Philemon from the Apostle Paul? I think this is why Paul... Greeting includes Aphia and Archippus, whom many scholars believe were Philemon's wife and son. According to Roman custom, wives were responsible for the daily oversight of household slaves. So Philemon's decision regarding Onesimus would naturally have bearing on his sweetheart and on his son. So they're included in this. Third, this is the only introduction where Paul identifies himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. The only letter where he does this. Elsewhere he uses apostle, he uses servant, but not here. Why? Two suggestions. A, he's contrasting his situation under house arrest in Rome with Philemon's freely serving in Colossae. Perhaps that would motivate Philemon to have a more positive response towards Paul's petition on behalf of Onesimus. Another suggestion is based on the tenor of Paul's letter. He's not writing as one in charge, giving commands authoritatively as an apostle, but as one appealing to a friend on behalf of another. Now, having said this, and before wrapping up, what do we know of Philemon? Well, based on what you're going to read this week, and this is your homework assignment. Read Philemon at least ten times. At least ten times. Here's some of what you're going to discover. First, Philemon was a convert of Paul. A convert of Paul. Second, he was a native of Colossae. Third, he was a man of means, having property large enough to host the Colossian fellowship and to provide a guest room for Paul. 
Fourth, he was generous and loving. Fifth, he was Paul's beloved friend and fellow laborer or worker. And six, his son Archippus, a fellow soldier, was probably a minister of Colossae or perhaps Laodicea. Well, what are you basing that on? Ah, you ask. Go to Colossians chapter 4. Let's turn back there. Colossians in chapter 4. And look at the last couple of verses, or close to the last couple of verses. 16 and 17. Verse 16. Now, when this epistle, Colossians, is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, probably referring to the letter of Ephesians. These were circular letters. They were passed around among these churches that were in the same locale. And verse 17, say to Archippus, or Archippus, the son of Philemon, Take heed to the ministry, keep an eye on the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. And so if dad is hosting the church as a man of, of means, a, a Christian man who loves God and loves God's people, it makes sense that his son would probably be directed in, in the realm of ministry. And, and so he's received a ministry. He could have been the very pastor of the church that dad was hosting in the house. I have an uncle and his son actually is now pastoring in his stead. You know, at the church where he was at for years, his son. And then his son is the assistant or youth pastor. And so there's just this generational thing going on in this particular church. So this is not beyond the realm of imagining. Or he was the pastor at Laodicea. We don't know for sure. Recently, I was speaking with someone about their job choice, about the profession that they had gone into. And they made this insightful statement. you got to want it. You've got to want it. If not, you will not last. Long shifts, short nights, tough calls, and everything in between will be your undoing unless you want it. Sounds like Teddy, doesn't it? Nothing worth having was ever achieved without effort. We were created to live in community. With God and who? Each other. But the question remains. Do you want it? Do we really want that? Are we willing to invest the effort as we're energized by the Holy Spirit? Pastor, I don't know. Days are difficult and struggles are steady. I'm not sure I'll make it let alone connect with God or anyone else along the way. I wonder if similar thoughts coursed through the mind of Onesimus as he began his long journey back to Colossae. What did he think about through that whole trip? Lord, I don't think I can do this. I trust you, but I'm terrified. I know what Paul said, but what if my master refuses to welcome me? How am I supposed to handle this? The same way I found you, Onesimus, by my grace. Period. Paul opened his letter to Philemon with that familiar, repeated phrase, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what you're up against today. I don't know what next week has in store. What fears you're confronting, what faith issues you're facing, but I do know, according to this book, that God's grace is sufficient. As our final song is going to remind me. Father, I can't imagine the, the incredible change that occurred in Onesimus' life when there in Rome he is hiding out and then it crosses paths with the Apostle Paul. Was it something that Philemon had said about Paul in the past when he was a slave serving him that you brought back to his mind? Did he hear while in Rome that there was this fella that you could go and visit with that would talk about the way, would talk about Jesus? Was there something that 
he could tell him that would help in his situation? We're not told, but we know that he met with Paul. Paul shared the gospel. Onesimus repented of his sin and he trusted Christ as his Savior and it changed everything. And it was all because of your grace. Lord, in this week ahead, whether it's a fear that we're dealing with, a faith issue that we're working through, I pray that we will avail ourselves of your grace that is sufficient, that is unlimited, that is freely given for our benefit so we might continue to grow and become what you've called us to be, to live a life worthy of that calling so that we can experience authentic communion with you and then with one another and invite others to join us on the journey. We love you. We thank you so much that you are faithful in loving each of us. Go with us now as we leave this place or we join together for Sunday school, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. God bless, saints. Have a good and safe week.